in the last 20 minutes, we looked at the root. The Bible says God did not lead Moses. Now, we'll take a look at the route God did lead them. And here, again, the biblical sources are all in agreement that they set out from Ramesses, and the first place they went to was the place called Sukkot. You can see that here in Exodus 12, Numbers 33. They set out from Ramesses, and they encamped, there's that word, camped, set up their tents, at Sukkot, Numbers 33, 5. So here is Ramesses, again by Kantir. And remember what we said before, there were two roads in and out of Egypt, the one by the coast and the other that lined up with the Wadi Tumulat and went across Sinai this way. So it's not surprising then, uh, and here's just another uh, Google Earth image. This is a Landsat image. This is Google Earth image. And so, again, Wadi Tumalat preserves the name of Atum, who is described as the Lord of Cheku. Cheku is the Egyptian name. The Hebrew name of Cheku is Sukkot. And this survives into Arabic as Maskhuta. Okay? So all of that's important. So look at the yellow dot from Google Earth. There's Ramesses. Here is Tel al -Maskuta. And there, again, is our reminder of Atum. And he is called Lord of Cheku, or Lord of Sukkot. There. So he is the most important god in this area. Why the area is still called Wadi Tumalat and he is the Lord of Cheku, the name of this whole area. So, here we are then, Ramesses to Maskuta or Sukkot, represents traveling the opposite direction from this route, but heading towards the Wadi Tumulat and the other way to leave Egypt. Now, Papyrus Anastasi 5. We've looked at 6. Now I want to take you to Papyrus Anastasi 5. It contains a copy of a letter from the reign of Seti II, around 1200 BC, but the original of the letter is believed to date to year 33 of Ramses II. In other words, these letters are letters that were copied by students to learn how do you write a good letter. And so they copy older letters. So the older letter seems to go back to the time of Ramses II, year 33, which would be 1246. So almost 50 years later, scribes are making copies of this letter just to, to learn how to write properly. Now here's what it says, and it's really very interesting. The military commander, his name is Kakemwer, and he is based at Cheku, or Sakot. And he reports what happened. He says, I was sent from the broad halls of the king's house. Of course, the king's house is Pyramuses. On the third month of harvest, day nine, the season of harvest, day nine, at the time of evening, after two workers. He is chasing two workers, probably slaves, who are running away. When I reached the fortress at Cheku on the third day, uh, day 10. So he made it in one day travel from day nine, leaving Ramesses, day 10, he arrives at the fortress Cheku and he's in pursuit of two runaway slaves. Very small exodus, but not the Hebrew exodus. You're looking at a picture here of Professor James Allen of Brown University and the former president of the International Association of Egyptologists. And he describes this text by saying, although the fugitives, the, well, the men running away, 
are described as workers, their route, the route they suggest ran, suggests they were Asiatics, not Egyptians, rather than Egyptians, attempting to escape to Canaanite territory. Very interesting. If these two men thought this is the way to escape Egypt, um, maybe a less fortified way than the other way, but still fortified, uh, Professor Allen suggests that they were trying to escape Egypt as best they could and not be noticed. So if that's true, uh, that might explain why the Hebrews are going the very same direction. You can visit Tel el Mascuta today, as I mentioned earlier. It's now being excavated by um, Italian archaeologists. And in the last year or so, they discovered two fortified walls. Um, but both of them are from a much later period, not the period of Moses and the Exodus. Uh, excavations were conducted in the 1970s and 80s by another one of my professors, uh, Professor uh, Jack Holliday, John Holliday, and uh, he noticed in his excavations that from about 1700 BC, that is, there was occupation during the Hyksos period, but for a thousand years he claimed there was no occupation. He found no evidence of people living there until the 7th century, the 600s. And this led him to believe that uh, this site was not, did not function during the period of the Exodus, and therefore um, it shows that the Exodus story is written much later when this site was functioning. He came to this conclusion. Um, it's always very difficult to disagree with your professors in writing, but I did, and I do. But what's interesting, and what he failed to really take into account, is the number of inscribed materials that were found at Tel el Mascuta before he got there, such as this, this falcon with the cartouche of Ramses II. Here is a statue of an Egyptian military officer from the 800s, so 150 years before he said uh, the site was built again. So this was a military officer. So there must have been a fort there in the 9th century. There was also a chapel made of granite of Ramses II also found there. So something is going on there in the earlier period. It's just that where Professor Holliday was digging, he didn't find any. And we have to be careful when we dig to realize that any one area of an archaeological site will not give you the complete picture of what was at the site. For instance, if we only came to this building and went to the church next door, we would say, oh, there's a very nice church, but there's no auditorium here, unless you came to this building and looked. In nine years ago, in 2010, um, there was a work was being done on the railroad and they were putting, a, there's railroad tracks. They were making some roads and putting in some water pipelines and accidentally they discovered a tomb. Uh, and this tomb uh, has inscriptions just inside of it, you can see here. And by the way, there's that brick, the rebirth brick we showed you earlier. And the weighing of the heart, there's the birth brick, okay. So he wants to be born again. Um, so the tomb belongs to a general. Why is a general buried here unless there's a fort somewhere nearby? The officer in charge of a fort would not be buried in the middle of the desert unless his <coughs> office was nearby. So clearly there was a fort in this earlier period. We just haven't found it. But there's enough material here to say something was going on. We have Cheku or Sukkoth mentioned in the Anastasi papyri. We now have a tomb of a general who would have fit at the time those papyri were written. And we have the statues of Ramses II. So I think we can say for sure that something was going on in the Ramesside period here. Archaeologists did yet have not found the fort. They found later forts, but not the earlier fort. And that's the way it is with archaeology. Sometimes we have to wait till new material is found, but the indications now are good. 
to say this place was functioning during the period of the Exodus, Professor Holliday jumped to a conclusion based on too little evidence. And you know, sometimes as believers, we take too little evidence and we wanna make it work because it fits the Bible. People who disagree with the Bible will take too little evidence to use against the Bible. So the best thing is to use all the evidence that's available, and sometimes we have to wait for more evidence to come. Okay, so stage one, Ramesses to Sukkot. Stage two, they moved from Sukkot and encamped at Etam on the edge of the wilderness. So, as we see it here, they are at the edge of the wilderness, and Etam, by the way, also seems to preserve the name of Atum. So it seems to be still in the general Wadi Tumalat area, at the edge of the wilderness. In other words, they're, they're ready to leave. You can see the edge of the wilderness. One, again, remember, no Suez Canal 3,000 years ago, right? <laughs> uh, it was just a matter of walking into the desert at that point. And it's at that point where in Exodus 14.2 we read, God says to Moses, tell the Israelites to shuv, turn back, and camp in front of pi Hachirot, between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal Safon. You shall come opposite it by the sea. So he says, turn back. Now we've seen that word how many times now? God doesn't want them to turn back from the one road. Now on this road he says, turn back. So this would suggest turning back in the direction from which they had come, more or less, which means turning north. And up towards a place called Pihahirot, Migdal, and the sea, and Balsafon. We do not have enough time to look at all of these. If you wanted to stay another two hours, we could. I've written about it, but I'm gonna focus in on two. I'm gonna focus on Migdal, and the sea. In the box up there is uh, an area where for 10 years my colleagues and I worked doing archaeological and geological survey work to understand the ancient environment of this area. This is a, this is a satellite image. It used to be CIA from 1967, and now you can buy these from uh, the, the US Geological Survey. But these pictures are amazing because now, if you look at Google Earth image, all you see is farms, farmland, fields. But this was before all the Salam, uh, Salam irrigation project. So you see things as they were uh, 50 years ago. And what we see here is this was the ancient coastline. In other words, all this area here was the Mediterranean Sea. Today, from here to Port Said is 50 kilometers. That's how much the delta has built out in the last 3,000 years. So here you can see the two forts I showed you earlier, Hebwa 1, and Hebwa too, and there was a body of water that went in between them, a Nile branch, and emptied into this large lake or lagoon, which you can see here, and then the Mediterranean Sea was out here. Where you see the red star is the site Tel Al Borg, where uh, my team excavated between 1999 and 2008. We found two forts, you're inside here, inside the walls of a moat. And if translators don't know what the word moat, chanda. Okay, chanda. Moat, and interestingly made of red brick. Very unusual to find in the New Kingdom, red brick. Usually you see brick like this in the Roman period. But this is 3,500 uh, 3, year old brick. 
here's a look at the foundations. Yeah. Here's another look of the moat that surrounded the fort. And you can see up here on top is where the walls would have gone up. Those walls are all gone because this area is close to the Mediterranean in ancient times and there was a lot of rain. Here, some of our workers were digging and you can see the wall, the top of the, the wall here. Um, and they were digging and right in this area, I sent one of my young workers, one of my students, he was, uh, had no experience in digging and we sent him there because we didn't want him to damage any antiquities because it was all sand. And he took his wheelbarrow, barawita, and he started to dig and he went with his shovel, threw it into the, the wheelbarrow and he heard a noise. Thunk. And he looked, he found gold. Beautiful gold. Including earrings. It was a piece, 34 pieces of gold. And so these earrings, interesting, because this was the kind of earring women would have worn about 3,300, 3,400 years ago. So when you think of the story about Aaron telling the women to take their earrings and he made the golden calf, that's what they were giving up. Earrings like that. Okay, so our fort, this is red, is, represents the, the fort, uh, the earlier fort uh, with the red bricks. Then we had a second fort from the era 1300 down to 1100. And a lot of this was destroyed by a canal going through here, the blue and the walls, uh, the roads. This is all part of the Tirath Salam project and destroyed uh, much of the ancient fort. Here you can see the walls of the second fort and we are at the very bottom of the, la of the wall. So we have 10 meters of wall gone, all by wind, and rain erosion, 10, 10 meters of wall gone. So again, that, to remind you that things only survive if the environment allows it. If you're in a moist environment, you see what the walls are like. In Luxor, you saw the mud brick walls all the way complete because there's no rain or almost no rain in Luxor. So here are the walls of the second fort we also found that this fort had also a moat, very different construction. From it, we found stones that were reused in the foundation, but originally dated to Amenhotep II, uh, 1427 to 1400 BC. We also found in the moat was used as a zabala, and they threw the bones of dead horses and dead donkeys. And here we have a couple horses that were thrown in. I told some of my friends, we think they drowned, but we're not sure. Okay. So this is Tel El Borg, and why is it important? It's important, as you'll see, because it helps us identify where the site of Migdal is. So we go back to that verse, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Piha he wrote between Migdal and the sea, in front of it, opposite uh, uh, Balsaphon. Now we go back to our, our map from Karnak Temple, Seti the first, and again we see the forts. The two forts on either side of the body of water at Hebwa that I showed you. This is the fort, I believe, the dwelling of the lion or Tel El Borg. The next fort in the sequence is called Migdal. And the reason that's significant is that the word Migdal is not an Egyptian word. It's a Semitic word. And you know the word uh, from reading the Bible because it's the same word as Mary Magdalene. Mag Migdal is a tower or a fort. And many of these names survive into Arabic as Magdal or Majdal. And there are many villages 
in, in, in Jordan and Syria, Palestine and Israel called Majdal or Magdala. And this probably means there was a fort in ancient times. So, but in Egypt, because it's a foreign word, it's very rare. But here we have a, a fort called Migdal and the name of Menmaatre is, is the king Seti I. So right by the border of Egypt, there is a fort called Migdal. Now, is this the same fort mentioned in Exodus 14.2? I believe it is. In the Bible, we have Migdal used a number of times, including by the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and then in the book of Numbers and in the book of Exodus. Now, it's hard to believe that Migdal of Exodus and Ezekiel that are uh, seven, eight hundred years apart could be one and the same place. Now, I want to take you to an old map. This is an old map suggesting here is the modern town of Kantara Shark, here's the Suez Canal, here's that area we showed you was the coastline in ancient times. If you go back to 1920 to a professor named Gardner from Oxford, he suggested that a site here called Tel Abu Seifi is the fortress Charu that I just showed you. Uh, a small little site here, Tel Ahmar, he thought was the dwelling of the lion. And Tel El Hair here he thought was Migdal. And that made sense for 80 years. But for 80 years, no excavations had been done at any of those sites. Now here's the site of Tel el Hair. It's the most impressive tell in North Sinai. It actually looks like a tell. Most sites are very flat. A tell is a mound. French have been working here since the 1980s. Uh, Dominique Valbel, and she found two forts, all from the Persian period. And so from the Persian period down to the Greek period, it's a fort and almost certainly a place called uh, Magdala that we know from Greek texts. And you can see it over here. Now, about two kilometers to the north, there is another site. And here in the foreground are the walls of a lay another fort. And in the background, you can see Migdal or Magdala Tel al -Hair. This fort was discovered by an uh, Israeli uh, named Eliezer Oren during the Israeli occupation. He published his results, and then Egyptian colleagues have worked at the site since, and they've discovered uh, very nice walls. But this fort existed from about 600 to 525, and it was destroyed when the Persians invaded. And so it seems that this fort was moved to Tel al Hair, over here, and the name continued all the way down to Roman times. And it was called Magdala in Greek texts. So it preserved the ancient name Migdal. But there's nothing there from the time of Seti I. Nothing at this site that would be from Seti I. So once again, where is the evidence from the biblical period? Well, thankfully, Seti I tells us about this fort. Ramses II tells us about this fort. And also Ramses III tells us about this fort. Now, I want to point out here at the very southern end of this lagoon, there's an archaeological site, and here, now here's what this looks like today, Google Earth, okay? Here's Tel El Borg, here's Hebel 1 and 2, here's Tel El Hair, Tel Kedwa, and here at the very southern end of what was the lagoon is a site that Professor Oren identified during his survey in 1970. He gave it the name T21. Here again, you can see. Now here's the 1967 uh, satellite image, and you can see there's something growing here. And Professor Oren marked this area 
and said within this area there was all kinds of pottery and broken stone, clearly an archaeological site. And he gave it the name T21, but it was never excavated. There you can see a close up even more. Then I was able to get a hold of a 1957 Egyptian Air Force picture of this area, and you can see much more clearly, 1957, walls uh, around a fort, very large, 240 meters, maybe by 170 meters, very large fort. Today you cannot see it. It's a fruit farm. It's covered with sand and covered with trees. So the best we have is this satellite image from, 19, or Air Force image from 1957. Here you see Ramses III, and he has been engaged in a very important battle, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. And he's celebrating his victory. Egypt was invaded by people uh, coming by land and coming by sea. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And here he is with his chariot, and beside the chariot is a fort. It's a picture of the fort. I will enlarge it. Here it is. And it has the name, the Migdal of Ramses III. So clearly, even till the days of Ramses III, 1175 BC, there was a fort on the border of Egypt called Migdal. So, now taking all the geological information, my geological team uh, put together, along with the archeological data and Google Earth image, we can reconstruct what this area looked like back in the days of the Exodus. So what you see is the Mediterranean coastline. You see a Nile branch that comes out here. Here are the two forts, Hebba I, Hebba II, Tel El Borg, and I believe this is Migdal, and another New Kingdom site, Tel Abyad, right here. So this was the road that God did not lead them on. And you can see the dangers. You come down this road, you have a fort, you'd have to cross water, another fort, cross water, another fort, surrounded by lakes on both sides. This would be very dangerous. So you can understand why God says he didn't lead them that way. Now, I also want to call your attention to this green water area, this marshland that extends almost up to Tel El Borg. And this is an extension of a larger body of water that Egyptian texts call Patufi. And Patufi linguistically corresponds to the Hebrew Yam Suf, Sea of Reeds. Papyrus Anastasi III mentions Patufi, this, this marshland, this reed lake, comes to Ramesses, that is the capital city, with rushes, Menhu, and the lake of Horus, Pashihor, with reeds. What this is describing is how this area outside of the delta is very rich in, like, like uh, the area of uh, Lake Mariut today, okay? You know, King of Mariut, all these areas, all these lakes and rushes and so on, uh, plants growing. This is what you had out here. Now, many years ago, Professor Manfred Bitak, who excavated the Hyksos capital at Tel Adaba over here, was trying to map what the delta area looked like in ancient times. And this was his map. And here is, here is Ramesses, and uh, there's Tel Adaba, the Hyksos capital, the neighboring site of Ramses. Here is this large body of water known in recent times as al Balah, the Balah Lake. And it extends north almost to up here, our work has shown. Now, it was Professor Bitak in 1975 who actually suggested that this body of water here was what the Egyptian text called the waters of Horus, she hor and that this body of water was what Papyrus Anastasi called Patufi, the, the marshy sea or the sea of reeds. And so, uh, very interesting, the combination of these two places right beside each other. 
Now, if you go there today, you'll see two different things. East of the Suez Canal, you will see areas where the reeds still grow three, four meters high. This is Dr. Stephen Mosier, the geologist I worked with, uh, who helped reconstruct the ancient environment. Um, and here we are on the, the, sorry, that was the west side. This is the east side, it's all desert east of the Suez Canal, the ancient lake is now gone. Uh, this is Dr. Baha Gayed, who I, I thought might be here, but he's not. He's a geologist with the Geological Survey, and uh, he is supervising drilling as we're trying to understand the history of the lake. The work that they did enabled us to uh, say a lot more about this area, and um, uh, so, uh, we know that this lake was active during the New Kingdom period. Um, and the other thing we now know, its location uh, is almost certain uh, to be here. Now notice the two forts of, of Charu, the two forts I showed you, here's Tel Borg. Notice where this is located. This is considered the end of Egypt. When you leave Charu, you've left Egypt, is the idea. I take you to one more papyrus today, the Anamastikon, which Anamastikon means list of names. It's a long list of names by a scribe named Amun M. Opie, and you can see the dates. He provides for us a list of cities, a list of cities in Egypt going from the south all the way to the far north. Uh, it begins at Aswan, just south of Aswan, Biga Island, which is just south of Elephantini Island. It's number 340 on the list. And as you go north, we will skip all the way up to Memphis, just below Cairo, number 394. 410 is Piramises, the capital of Ramesses during the 20th dynasty, of course. 417 is Tanis, which is further north. 418 is Patufi, this lake, Reed Lake area. And then the last place named is Charu, that frontier fort. So it's very clear that the ancient geographers understood that this body of water was just south of those forts of Charu, okay? Now, one other indication provided by the Bible itself. Uh, I'm giving this translation uh, since we're meeting in a, in a Roman Catholic facility. This is the New Jerusalem translation, which is a Roman Catholic translation. So, uh, and this is what it says. This is when the plague of locusts covered Egypt and God was gonna get rid of the locust. Yahweh changed the wind to a west wind very strong, which carried the locust away and swept them into the Sea of Reeds. That's why I use this translation. It translates Yam Sufa's Sea of Reeds, not Red Sea. So the locusts were blown away from Ramesses and the Delta and were swept into the Sea of Reeds. So here's Ramesses, here's our locusts, and there's the Sea of Reeds. Boom, right in there. So uh, this is my suggestion then, that this body of water is relatively close to the capital because it was only three places they camped from the time they left, and one of them resulted after turning back. So the point is, we're not too far from Ramesses. We're not on the other side of Sinai going into Arabia, as some people are suggesting now. You're crossing the Gulf of Aqaba and going into um, Arabia. Rather, this is somewhere close to the border of Egypt because once you pass through this, you're no longer in Egypt. Once you leave, get into Sinai, you are no longer into Egypt. So, how does all this information now add up? All the places we've been talking about, the word toponyms is the word for place names, names of places, the toponyms are all authentic, real, 
and are documented in texts from the 19th dynasty or the era of Ramses. So Ramses, of course, P. Ramesses, we've mentioned that. Pithom was found in Papyrus Anastasi VI, again from the era, the Ramesside era. Sukkot or Cheku occurs many times in um, different papyri. Migdal is mentioned in the reliefs of Seti that we were just looking at, also the reliefs of Ramses III. Um, and Yam Suf is mentioned in Papyrus Anastasi III and Papyrus Anastasi VIII and the Onomasticon of Amenemope. In other words, every one of these places we can document uh, from 13th century documents. So these are not places made up 500 years later by somebody trying to make up a story. These are all documented in the period where I believe the Exodus took place, and that would be somewhere in the 19th dynasty, possibly during the reign of Ramses II, but I won't uh, go down fighting for that suggestion, but it's a good working hypothesis. So there you have your C, and I think what appears to be a very accurate uh, geographical picture. And I think it helps authenticate what the story is telling us, because these places are not made up, they do make sense, you can plot some of them on a map, uh, others not yet, but we're getting closer. When I started this 20 years ago, uh, we couldn't be sure of a number of these places, and now we can be much more sure about them. So my confidence in all of this is growing stronger, and I hope yours is too. Thank you.